Hello everyone and welcome. Sit back, relax, and get comfortable because this is a wonderful time for new stories from Yellowcat. Write your own stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. Let's get started. In the first story, I'm teaching the neighbor who is the real owner of this property. In the second story, Charity Lady demands special treatment and gets it, resulting in a nice backslap for her. In the third story, Entitled Neighbor ruins communal property with series of improvements that she didn't have permission for. We're all peed. The first story is, Neighbor definitely didn't expect this. When I was really young, our neighbor, Druggy, demanded we move our septic tank because he claimed it was partially on his property. He was a complete jerk about it and kept at it. My dad is a really laid back person. Eventually, even he got mad and had the property line surveyed. Turns out, not only was the septic tank on our property, not his, but the corner of his house and part of his driveway was actually on our land. Dad spent the next few months asking him when he was going to move his house off our land. You know, it seems that the people who are always, like, really defensive about their property and not having anyone else's things on their property never actually know where their own property line is. And then stuff like this happens. The second story is Karma Hits the Bad Samaritan. Cast. Fred, a reporter of that newspaper in charge of editing the material for this project. Karen leader of a charity that collects donations to help Afghan children and women in Afghanistan. Ken, Karen's nephew and one of the editors at the newspaper, one level higher than Fred but not his direct supervisor. Eva, trans woman, leader of a charity that distributes donated uncooked food for a week to the ones in need. Me, a guest at the gala and a friend of Fred. Background. A few years ago, in a time when a large amount of refugees came to my country and many charity organizations focused their effort on them, but there were still several charities focusing on senior citizens, children, poor people, animal help. To honor the organizations helping the society and to raise awareness, the local newspapers started a contest for the best charity in the region. Each week, they would bring an article on one charity and in the end, the readers would vote who was the best. After that, a gala was held, a short film on each charity was presented, and the audience and a jury would elect their favorite. The three votes would be merged into one result. The final winner would receive a 5,000 euro donation for the charity. The build-up. Over the time all charities were presented in the newspaper, only two major incidents happened. One, Karen started suggesting that charities not focused on refugees should be expelled because they're not following the needs of this time. Two, Karen, supported by Ken, was ranting to the directors of the newspaper that Eva should be disqualified because this perverted guy is a racist. Eva's charity started to supply refugees with food in addition to the ones they already supplied. Everyone still got enough food and it was spread equal. No first come gets best stuff. But after some refugees used their fists to get a place more at the front of the line, Eva split the handout day in two days. One for refugees and one for the other people in need. Both requests had been whipped away by the directors. After the articles, all charities supplied the newspaper, Fred, with videos of their work, and Fred came for a video interview. Fred had to cut it together to a video of two minutes interview and three minutes of their work. All charities send in their video footage. All had been told it will be cut down to three minutes, so they should send around five to ten minutes of their work. Most did as told. Karen sent in eight hours of unedited, uncut videos from her last trip to Afghanistan. Fred asked her to narrow it down to the things she wanted to be in. She told him, shut up and do his fine job. She also demanded that her video has to be at least 15 minutes because her work with lovely children is far more important than the useless stuff the others do. It went back and forth and she always demanded a longer video. Fred did his best and made four clips, three minutes, of good-looking stuff and asked which one she wants. All of them and some more. You missed some of the important stuff. You will not cut me down against the other organizations. Next were the interviews with the charity staff. Again, all went smooth with everyone except, you guessed it, Karen. 
The interview with Karen was by far the most difficult, with all her demands on what he has to do exactly as she tells him or she will have Ken make HR kick him out. Fred did as she told him and got some nice video footage to work with. You should not threaten the job of someone, especially in Germany. We take this very personal, and so did Fred, but Karen gave him everything he needed. The day before the gala, Fred sent Karen three videos of five minute length, two of eight minute length, and one of 20 minute length and asked her, which of these videos do you want to be played tomorrow evening? After four minutes, he got the answer, the longest one, cause as I have told you a million times, Fred smiled satisfied, I guess. The gala, as you might know, if a series of content is presented to you at the end, the first one is more present in your mind than most others, and the last one is by far the most present in your mind. So the last presentation spot gets a slight advantage. And who would have guessed, shortly before the gala, Karen demanded a new spot when her video should be played. She needed the last spot because she had an important video chat with the children earlier that evening. The time of the gala would be in the middle of the night in Afghanistan, so sure, she was about to chat with the children. I came quiet early and was greeted outside not by the organizations from the newspaper, but by Karen explaining to every visitor how great her charity is and how important her help is for the lovely children. The gala started, all groups got presented and praised, and the videos came up. As demanded, the last one was Karen's video. The interview part was normal, but after the two minutes, it went on with her explaining how much money she saves after giving up her flat and moving into the house the charity was renting as office and storage, illegal to live in a designated office, how the nice furniture were donations to the charity and too good to waste them, and that it is just fair since she quit her job for the charity and the money she pays herself each month is only slightly more than she made before. Then the work footage came up. First came a nice video of her surrounded by smiling, waving children all perfectly lined up. Then a video of the same setting, children not well organized, her pushing them around very forcefully onto the places she wanted them. A boy moved from his spot. She hits him in the face. Stay in your place, you little rat. This has to be perfect. And stop crying or you get another one. The room was dead silent. You could have heard a butterfly sneeze if one had done so. Karen stormed out of the room, shrieking, This will have consequences! As you might have guessed, the audience and the jury voted her last place. Fallout. A charity that taught refugees how to repair donated bicycles that they could keep after repairing it won the prize. Karen got fined for illegally living in a designated office building. The Office of Taxes checked her charity's paperwork and it came up. She stole a lot of money from that charity, enough to get it closed down, and she went to court, result not publicly known here, but she was no longer seen around. Ken tried to get Fred into trouble, but the director stood on Fred's side. They just asked Fred to inform them next time and not pull such a stunt again. It is absolutely sickening every time I'm reminded that people like this exist in the world. But it is nice when karma hits him like a truck. The third story is Entitled Neighbor Decides Communal Garden is Now Hers and Ruins It. Now, without going into too much detail, I live in Scotland and reside in what's called a tenement house. Imagine a block of flats, but smaller and older. Very common here. Anyway, all the tenements on my street have a front and back garden. We own the front garden as it came with our flat, but the back garden is communal and is shared between all residents within our tenement. Now, onto the entitlement. We have a neighbor who lives in the flat directly above us. We live on the ground floor, this will be important later. Now, this neighbor, who we'll call EN, has always been generally annoying and kinda insufferable, always talking in a really slow tone as though you're inept. However, back in June, her head Aery ascended to a new level. EN has always been into her gardening, which there's obviously nothing wrong with, but she started coming up with a plan to use the back garden for her gardening. Now, on paper, this was also fine. 
All she had to do was get the permission of all the other residents within our tenement, of which there were about 10. She didn't do that. At all. All. In fact, the first we learned of her plan was her slipping a piece of paper through our door that outlined what she was going to do, not wanted to do, going to do. The plan itself wasn't great, but it was by no means awful, so my mom let it slide. Fast forward two months, when all of a sudden I come home, look out my bedroom window, which overlooks the back garden, and see not the raised wooden beds and terracotta pots that had been proposed, but 15 plastic laundry baskets filled with soil, 12 empty milk bottles in place of color enamel tins, and a massive F-off compost bin. Safe to say, me and my mom were peed. My mom had a strong word with Ian about it, and Ian claimed she'd remove the milk bottles by the end of the week. I ask you not, the milk bottles weren't removed for nearly three months, all while serving no purpose as there wasn't anything in them. In the meantime, everything else she'd been trying to grow had died a rapid death, but she'd done nothing about it. During her milk bottle removal ordeal, Ian also dealt with one of the many soil-filled laundry baskets now complete with rotting vegetation. How did she deal with it? Did she remove it and dispose of the contents accordingly? Of course not, this is Ian we're dealing with here. Instead, she tipped the basket up and over, dumping all the soil and dead plants onto the already overgrown grass, took the basket back to her flat, and just left all the soil as it were. How my mom hadn't snapped by this point, I have no idea, but credit to her. Over the next two weeks, two raised wooden beds were finally put in, but the plants in them also quickly died and, as of writing this, are still yet to be dealt with. Ian also added this weird metal beam archway thing between two of the laundry baskets and attempted, failed, to twist one of the longer plants around said archway. It was hideous. However, a small, and I do mean small, dose of karma was just around the corner. If you're a UK resident, you will remember Storm Arwen hitting a week or so back, and as a result of this, Ian's treasured archway was blown over completely and, as you would fully expect from Ian by now, is still to be dealt with. So, here we are in December with an essentially trashed bank garden, laundry baskets with dead plants in them, raised beds with vegetation so dead it had begun to turn yellow, a crooked archway, an actual mound of soil, and overgrown grass everywhere. Also, since our flat is on the ground floor as I mentioned earlier, our home value has almost certainly been damaged by this, which is even more problematic as we intend to move within the next few years. I should also note that we're not the only ones who are royally effed off with Ian's improvements, but nothing more has come of it as of now, though my mom says she'll be elevating to a higher level if nothing changes by the time we do come to move. So I got a theory about this woman. I'm thinking that the reason why she wanted to use the back garden was because everything in her front garden had died and she somehow convinced herself that they all died because they didn't have enough space, so she went to the back garden. But what I wanna know is how is it that no one stopped this lady from doing what she was doing? Cause like, after the milk jug incident, you'd think that people would have figured out that she had no idea what she was doing. Thank you for listening to those stories. If you want to see new videos, be sure to subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the like button.